Good afternoon. This is Ray Tsuchiyama for Think Tech Asia. We're here on a very balmy afternoon in Honolulu. We're lacking today my co-host, Russell Liu, and it's just myself, Ray Tsuchiyama, with a guest all the way from Tokyo, Japan, whom I've known for many, many years. And his name is Jim Weiser. And he's with a company, a high-tech company that we'll uh, get into in a few minutes. And first, I want to welcome Jim to the show. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on the show today. Now, you're, you and I go way back. <laughs> and uh, you first arrived in Japan what year? It was 1993. 93. And I, was, I came in 91, so you came just around that time. So you're my years. senpai. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're my kohai. Uh, and so now you're originally from what state in the Union? I grew up in Texas. Okay. And uh, you went to a university there? Uh, yeah, I, I, I grew up in Fort Worth in Texas, and I went to school at Rice in Houston. And, and then I've heard that you were, had graduated from Rice University, mm -hmm. That's right. and that got you to Japan. Tell me how you got to Japan. Well, it, it maybe isn't the most direct route, but what had happened was at school I'd studied chemical engineering. And I had the opportunity, because Rice was in Houston, to go and work at in, or in an actual chemical plant. right? And that was great because what it showed me was that might not be where my passion lay. And so instead of going directly to the chemical industry after I graduated, I went and took a, I don't know, you say gap year if it's after right. you graduated. <laughs> I took an after you're, gap you're year. You were ahead of your time. <laughs> yeah, been right. raised, yeah we, didn't, we didn't call it that then. And I went to Japan to teach English. I thought, no, I'll do this for a year or two. And of course, that was, what, 24 years ago now. And, and the city that you taught English, yeah. uh, w where was it? I started in Sagamihara, which is a suburb outside of Tokyo. Okay. So, so um, and you did that for how many years? Uh, so I taught full-time for two years. I did a little bit for another probably six months after that. And I kind of, I got lucky, I guess, because what I considered to be my meager computer skills were in fairly high demand. And so I started doing computer training, some consulting work, and eventually ended up working in the internet for PSINet there. So um, you were at the dawn of internet in Japan, in hindsight, right? <laughs> in hindsight, yeah, in that's hindsight. probably true. Because there wasn't much going on. There were some internet, uh, I guess, uh, uh, servers and, and um, uh, you know, the Japanese side. But the, for uh, foreigners, there were very little uh, uh, at, at that time. That's, I think that's right. I think it's safe to say that there was very little going on in the internet comparatively anywhere in the world at that point. You know, there were a couple of companies of which PSINet was one that had kind of started the commercial internet. And in Japan, there were some companies in 96 when I got into it as well that were doing internet services for businesses. But nothing like we think of today. Because if you go back, uh, one of the major um, um, uh, networks or whatever, Nifty Surf under right. Fujitsu right. <laughs> was a very early uh, service, and mm -hmm. there was AOL uh, of that time um, in the U.S. You know, right. in the U.S. Uh, That's right. going strong. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, going uh, uh, a little more further, sure. um, now you worked in the internet space mm -hmm. uh, in the late '90s. Uh, what could you see? Uh, happened in the late 90s, early 2000s that really started to bring Japan into the internet age? Right. Well, I think there were several things, you know, because in Japan at that point, and really the internet generally, people were thinking it was predominantly a telecom service. They weren't thinking as much about data and you know, how, what are the different things you can do. Email was the big exciting new invention, right? And so when you look at it, the kind of the key things were moving from something that was always charged by the minute which right, is what right, you had right. with dial-up calling. Because right. you know, in the U.S., it, there were all these fixed-rate plans. If you get on your modem and you call right. AOL, one, one fee, you're done. But in Japan, that was all minute-spaced, right? So that was one big thing. And then the second thing was um, NTT, which was the dominant telco in Japan, and really still is, um, decided that maybe this Internet thing would catch on after all in, I believe it was 97 or 98, and released a product. Now, I was working at a company that was competing with it, and a lot of my colleagues were really concerned by that. But that was one of the best things that could have happened to us. Because once the really big company like that entered the market, it validated the entire offering. Now, also, on, uh, when we say, talk about Japan, mm -hmm. 
there was something happening in the mobile space called iMode. Yes. And that came out around 99, 2000, around that time. Yeah. And uh, that took Japan and society in a different area earlier than the US. That's right. Uh, and so that w was the uh, launch of iMode, yep. uh, which was based on digital communications mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and uh, data uh, and, and texting and also uh, how to access some sites. Would you say that delayed uh, PC and laptop internet usage, or that really um, uh, got Japan to a new new level faster? Uh, that's an interesting sort of question. So I think what you saw with iMode was that yeah, you know, it, it was the old dumb phones, it was pre-smartphone, right? And I think it started in '97. It might have been '98. But what they were able to do was they were able to put email on a cell phone. And that's pretty innovative. That's pretext, right? And so people were able to do a lot more. They were doing subscription-based content and a whole bunch of other things. You know, in 2000, 2001, 2002, like you're talking about, and even licensed it to other countries. Yeah. You know, so that the first email account many Japanese had was actually on their cell phone. On their phone. It right. was a. a, a it, I remember a Docomo account, mm -hmm. uh, email uh, yeah. uh, right. uh, uh, account or, or email address, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Right, no, that's right. And so because of that, in a lot of ways, I think that enabled the growth because it now gave you a reason to get on the net to do things, right? Um, yeah, if you look at a traditional uh, Japanese language input environment, the keyboard's not the most natural way to do it. That's right. And so if you, and if you talk to people who are, you know, completely bilingual in either language, they'll tell, even if they're native Japanese speakers, they'll tell you it's always faster to write in English because of the keyboard input mechanism. Well, you were at the dawn and then you went, we went through the I mode and the launch of internet I in Japan. Uh, where are we today? I mean, we have a, a sprawling landscape, uh, domestic landscape uh, mm -hmm. in Japan uh, that deals with the internet, uh, ranging from e-commerce on Rakuten. There are communities under Mixi. Mm -hmm. There are uh, GRI and, and uh, mobile uh, and, and also uh, games played a lot. Right. Uh, there's also SoftBank that mm -hmm. does a lot more in e-commerce. Uh, and millions of sites uh, yep. and so forth. Uh, how, is it a robust uh, landscape uh, in terms yep. of uh, the internet uh, and, and mobile, or it, it, has it morphed into something that uh, our friend uh, Gerhard says, a Galapagos island uh, that's, that's distinctly, you know, uh, that's different than Europe and the West and the US? Well, can I say yes to that? Okay, <laughs> yeah. all right, go so, ahead. So to start with, you know, you've named a lot of big names. now. Right now, the single biggest name in e-commerce in Japan is actually Amazon. Yeah, Amazon is roughly a third of the market. Rakuten is roughly another third. Yeah, and so they dominate. So, so the two are two thirds of the, so the, 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 the pie. Those two are roughly two yeah. thirds. Then between Yahoo Auction and Yahoo uh, Japan, right, they pick up another substantial oh, okay. amount. Right. So that's 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 what I remember. Right. You know, don't hold my feet to right. the fire. It might be only a quarter or a quarter. Yeah. But those are two giants right. in the space in e-commerce in Japan. I think what you see is... And one is foreign and one is do domestic. Amazon is... is well, is, sure, yeah. Amazon's foreign, but yeah. like any successful foreign company there, you know, 90-something percent of the volume they do is with Japanese people and their staff are predominantly Japanese. You know, that, that's not a unique kind of environment. Um, and I think there are certain industries like that in Japan, and you've probably seen that as well. Well, McDonald's is <laughs> well, right, <laughs> dominant right. in Japan, or 7-Eleven right. and others that have uh, become right. part of the uh, well, Japanese they society. Become, not only do they become part of the landscape, but in certain industries, you know, the U.S. or other countries are viewed as being innovators. And so there's a strong opportunity to enter the market, where if you go and say, oh, you know what, I'm an innovative construction company, the older Japanese construction companies will say, well, guess what? We've been building temples since 1600. You know, thank you very much, right? You know, so certainly in the internet space there's, and software as well, there's been more of an opportunity to approach the market. So uh, what you're saying is that uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on in e-commerce, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, but it has evolved towards large players uh, dominant in the space. Yeah, I think that's, that's fair. Um, there's also, you know, we're kind of being a little narrow on e-commerce. Okay. We're talking mainly right. about package shipment type stuff. And interestingly, um, there have been a number of articles recently where the Japan domestic shippers, for the first time in 20-something years, are raising their parcel rates 
because the volume that they're seeing in e-commerce generally are yeah, really going up, I, I, and the drivers are quitting. Yeah. <laughs> as you know, well, they're, they're getting stressed out by it, all it, the all the packages. That's and right. Delivery times have to be very, very you know, uh, just in time. <laughs> Basically, in a ten-year time period, the total parcel delivery rate's gone up somewhere around a third. Wow. And so that I mean yeah. that's a pretty big move. Yeah. And there's a declining workforce. You know, in in the U.S., the millennials are as large as roughly the baby boom, right? right. In Japan, they aren't. No. Yeah, in Japan, the millennial generation is smaller than uh, our generation X, right? And so we end up with a dichotomy or, or where you have a smaller labor market and a 30% increase or something like that in packages shipped. So, so the landscape of, of uh, companies in Japan and mm -hmm. economy, uh, we talk about big companies, the Sonys and Toyotas yep. and Sumitomos and, and Mitsuis and so forth. They're still there. Oh, sure. In the economy, mm -hmm. yep. right? And and Japan has not gone off the map. It's still the third largest economy in the world. That's right. right? And and still uh, has uh, major shipments of cars, of electronics, mm -hmm. uh, to all over the world. And the mm -hmm. brands are unbelievable uh, right. when you think about it. What's the landscape for startups? Has it has mm. it become better? I remember, you know, going back to the early 2000s, the Bit Valley. There was a, a sudden rise uh, of uh, venture funds coming to Japan and trying right. to accelerate uh, startups in Japan. It didn't flourish as it people blew expected. Up, right? yeah, it blew up, right? It, it, it yeah. didn't. And there were many reasons for that. Mm -hmm. And um, as you know, I work for MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a uh, synergy uh, between research at universities mm -hmm. and researchers and entrepreneurs, MBA mm -hmm. types, getting together and forming startups and mm -hmm. products and getting right. uh, uh, funding from uh, uh, from uh, venture funds and they go off and do exits and uh, become very uh, big or uh, they don't do so well, <laughs> right. which is the majority right. of all startups. Sure. Has that culture developed in Japan? Um, so I, let me start off by saying yes to the question you just asked. You're starting to see some motion in universities especially where, co not an entire cohort, but people from the same cohort or the same lab will go and start a company. And that's relatively new. You know, that's a, I believe that's a development that's new since you left, or at right. least over the last kind of 10 years ish, right? right? Um, but if I could use a couple examples from my kind of personal story, right? So in 2002, I was basically unemployed. And I couldn't find a job I thought that fit my skills or whatever. So I started a company. And that was a consulting company. And that was a typical, okay, I'm going to bill by the hour, I'm going to provide right. value for service. You know, always in tech-related things, but fairly wide range. You know, in 2005, I kept seeing more or less the same problems with the clients I was working right. with as it related to telephony, right? right? And in those days, you buy a big PBX and you stick it in your office. Right. There's no kind of cloud offerings, right. right? And so in 2006, I started a company that did that for businesses in Japan. You know, no, no consumer stuff. Right. It always be the right. um, Kind of fast forward 10 years later, and not only had that market kind of started to develop, it's still a little bit early stage, um, but that was when uh, my company at the time was acquired by Broadsoft. And we're going to take now. and we're going to take a, a minute to explain how this all came together after this break with ThinkTech Asia. Thank. You. This is Ray Tsuchiyama. We're back with our guest from Tokyo, 24 years in 
the third largest economy in the world in the areas that we always talk about innovation in information communications and um, uh, uh, internet uh, areas uh, he has been a been active in the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan and uh, and had even headed a committee in um, uh, in the chamber I also did a cover story for the American Chamber Journal back in 2000 on iMode. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I, I, I go back and also uh, in Japan, as you know, was on the board of uh, venture capital companies and plus right. uh, we did a uh, company called TGIC, which mm -hmm. was acquired mm -hmm. by AOL and later by Nuance. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, all, all you're talking to me and to the audience mm -hmm. uh, in Hawaii and beyond about Japan it's really exciting because people don't see uh, your, uh, people like yourself, entrepreneurs, in the trenches. And to explain what happened, and I want you to go back to your story about, uh, about uh, finding a solution uh, uh, for companies uh, in the cloud. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah, I mean, for us, we kept seeing the same problem, which is people were buying expensive stuff and putting it on site, right? And so the approach that we took was this should be a cloud offering. Now, we'd worked with a couple of different platforms, at, but at PBXL, we chose Broadsoft as our technology partner in 2012. And we'd worked closely with them, and you know, I, I knew pretty well a lot of the team in Asia. And so at the point we were looking to take external investment, we had some serious co uh, conversations with Broadsoft, and they said, well, actually, we're looking for a cloud deployment in Japan. Would you be interested in joining us as part of the team? And define yeah. Broadsoft. What kind of oh, company and where right. are they? So Broadsoft is headquartered in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Yeah, you know, we've got uh, uh, boy thirty different offices around the world, ninety-two different countries. People are using our stuff, and basically twenty-five of the top thirty carriers in the world um, use the platforms that we provide. Now the platforms are basically focused on enterprise collaboration and communication services for businesses right. in the cloud, right? So that can be something as simple as a desk phone where you also have an application on your smartphone, right? right? So that's the voice level, if right. you will. There's chat and team collaboration spaces. So many, many yeah. apps all integrated. So, uh, exa yeah. Exactly. Uh, for enterprise, we, for business. For enterprise, for business. To work together That's and collaborate right. and team and yep. to uh, uh, really move ahead on product development. That's right. Okay. And then the other piece that we didn't touch on was call center and oh. contact center stuff. So that, that's kind of what Broadsoft as a whole does. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, so we, we work together. I've been running the broad, broad cloud piece of Broadsoft in Japan now for a year and a half, a little more than that. So, uh, and so the venture area that mm -hmm. you were involved in, um, uh, our question was, you know, yeah. how, how did it change? Oh, right, <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. It's not all yeah. about me, yeah, right? right. Yeah. Well, it, as we talked about, I've done a little bit of angel right. investing. And I can talk about mistakes in that later no, no, if you no, want. No, no. But the, the things that are really different right now is probably in the early 2000s, if you looked at venture capitalists in Japan, there right. were very few, right? right? And the opportunity to get investment from them was relatively small. Right. And so you didn't see a, a monetary ecosystem right. that would sustain startups very right. well. You know, like when I was at PBXL, we actually took a loan from the bank. Right. Now to do that, I had to put a personal guarantee on, right? right. And you would find venture capital companies doing the same thing. Right, so what's the ago, difference, right? Right, yeah, so it's, no, it's, no, yeah, no it's kind of like, yeah. it's, it's the, the, what, the private loan market versus <laughs> right, the public right. loan market, no. right? And actually, one of the other venture companies I'd been involved with had done this whole loan thing from venture capitalists, <laughs> and it was a huge disaster. You know, the, right. the guy kind of goes personally bankrupt and stuff, right? right? Um, but now what you see, the common complaint is there aren't enough deals, mm. there aren't enough operators, right. there aren't enough, there's plenty of money chasing right. deals, right? And you see it in the valuations as well. Is that sustainable? I don't know. My only past experience with that was kind of Bit Valley, right. which all blew up. Right. You know. But you but, see a resurgence of of uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, and venture businesses yep. and uh, uh, corresponding uh, interest by venture capitalists. That's right. And okay. I think you hit on something that is really important that has changed. It used to be you'd never find a bunch of graduates from an elite mm -hmm. institution starting their own right. company, right? Now you see it, I'm not going to say frequently because right. that's probably overrepresenting yeah. it, but it's, it's not uncommon to see people come out of a research lab and right. start something or a cohort kind of say, but, we're going to go do this. But that's a 
tremendous sea change because as late as 10 years ago, the uh, place to go for re top researchers at Kyoto University or Tokyo yep. University or yep. Tokyo Institute of Technology or Osaka, you know, so they go to a Sony or Toyota or NEC or Fujitsu. Or, uh, or the know, government. Or, or, right? yeah, the research. government or NTT. Yeah, right? or, yeah. or NTT uh, labs in Yokosuka or whatever. Right. Uh, but to uh, do research that ends up in a product, to commercialization, right. that's a whole dramatic change. It, it, and to yeah. work with others mm -hmm. to kind of, uh, you know, put together a team, you know, uh, um, CEO, CTO, CFO, CMO right. kind of team, that is more Silicon Valley. Right, I, I think that's right. And, you know, and I'm not going to say it's Silicon Valley, right? right? You know, the Silicon Valley is unique. Right, right. Um, but it's it's but, analogous but, but, to uh, kind of a product you, uh, formation. You yeah. see the product formation approach. You see the yeah. businesses approach. And the thing I'm starting to look for is, will someone fund some? Will a VC fund someone who has failed once? Right. Because in Japan, in Japan, that's the yeah, big yeah, thing, that's, right? That's, yeah, that's yeah. a very good point. Yes. Uh, and the answer that I've been getting yeah. from a few of them yeah. is yes. Yeah, because right. in Silicon Valley, if you haven't, uh, you know, uh, gone bankrupt three times, <laughs> yeah, they, they'll, you know, they, 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 they think that you don't know your stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I feel that strongly about it, but yeah, yeah. But it's okay yeah. to fail and then have another idea. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. And what's interesting as well is when you look at the places people are going, you know, everyone associates Japan with kind of high tech, Sony right, right. or you know, air conditioners or stuff like that. But you also see a lot or a number of people going into the tourism space mm, right. because that area has been booming over the last 10, 15 years. You know, when I think when you left, there were what, maybe four million? Four, a year? four, four to five million. Four right. or five million, yeah. right? We're we're on track this year for over twenty. I don't and, know if it's over twenty-two and that, or twenty-five. That is unbelievable to me because uh, you know because the infrastructure of the Yokan Onsen has not changed. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they just accommodate you know other people from right. you know uh, everywhere from you know from uh, South America to the U.S. to mm -hmm. you know throughout East Asia and even Europe now. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And so that is a tremendous difference. And and I think it's kind of like leading to a uh, you know uh, a a wave for the 2020 Olympics, in fact, yeah. Right, no, I, I think that, that was a big part of it. When the Olympics was awarded to Tokyo, there was this kind of mental confidence shift that went on, like, oh, hey, okay, maybe we can right. do something, right? Because it's hard, if you have 25 years of no growth, right. that's a really hard economy right. to build a business yeah. in, right? And then you start to see people who are coming to Japan because what, what happens is Tokyo, while certain things remain very expensive, you know, I, I think I was, Right. Yeah, talking before, but it used to be when I go back to the mainland U.S., I go back to Texas, right? I go out to dinner with someone, and the the check had come, and I think, oh well, nah, that's pretty reasonable for my sixth or whatever right. of the check. But that wasn't the sixth of the check; that was the whole check, <laughs> right? right? right. Like, wow, okay, what a deal! Now, when I go back, and this is still Texas, this isn't right. even the most expensive places. Right. Um, the check comes. I think, well, that's a little much for my sixth of the check. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for my uh, whole, for the whole check. Yeah. But that's just my piece, <laughs> right, right? right? Yeah. And um, so, so yeah. Japan yeah. has become a bargain in many ways uh, for food, and 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 they see the quality of the food in Japan and right. products, uh, electronics, and all kinds of anime-related things, mm -hmm. clothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, th Japan has become a center of shopping. Right. Yeah. I, th I think not just a center of shopping, but particularly when you look at, you know, younger people tend to talk about they want experiences, right? right? right. So yeah. I want to go eat sushi in yeah. Tokyo, yeah. right? I want to go to the Hokkaido right. Snow Festival. Right. And as you know, all over these regional areas in Japan, there's always something, right? right? You take uh, uh, Aomori uh, Nebuta Festival mm -hmm. or Kumamoto, you're correct that, that uh, there's a... Uh, you know, uh, villages and, and small towns all have very distinct cultures in Japan. Right. And you're, you're right that uh, young people today are not looking for a, um, a experience, orthodox experience. They're looking for something that's distinct. Right. And it can be distinct in one village next to another in mm -hmm. Japan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, you, of course, you still see large busloads of tourists from right. certain countries who are like, okay, I really want to get this done or do that. And that makes sense too, from kind of the shopping perspective. I think. Yeah. So um, we had just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, you've been there 24 years, right? Yep. Uh, and the people who came with you, or been around, they came and left, and so forth. And mm -hmm. now you're still there in many, uh, many ways. And um, uh, what would you tell a person coming to Japan, and uh, maybe they want to start a venture, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. work in Japan? What, what would you tell them? Wow. So. I'd say just go for it. Yeah. You can create lots of reasons to not do it, 
right? A long list of right. bad possible yeah. outcomes, right? But basically, Japan is very civilized. It's safe. And even if you don't know the language, you can kind of get, get around. Right. You know, one of the things I think maybe that's changed as well since you've been there is you know, Japan's ability to do foreign languages on public transportation right, right. and so forth. It's been a Kaizen effect, wow. right? You go back wow. to the World Cup in 98. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it's right, like, right. okay, here's yeah. a little bit. Then yeah. you have the expo, and right. it just kind of ticks up and up and up. Yeah. And so because of that, now things are pretty addressable. Cool. And with the tourism having come right. up, yeah, you know, people want to want to do that. But that's we're talking about Tokyo. Uh, yeah. How about the other smaller towns? Is it affecting smaller cities and towns so also? Or? Somewhat. Yeah. You know, Tokyo is really different than right. a lot of Japan. Right. It's it's, it's much unique. more international. Like London city. is like in the UK like, or Great Britain. Yeah. yeah, or New York in the yeah. US. You know, they're not do not confuse those experiences right. with typical experiences, okay. right? And so it depends on what you want to do. If you want to start a business, Tokyo is roughly a third of the GDP. Well, yeah. So you have to be greater there. Tokyo. Yeah, yeah, right, so right. you could probably go somewhere else. Right. I mean, there are some foreign entrepreneurs I know who started a, a, a microbrew company, right. company right. in Shizuoka. <laughs> right. There are some people who own ski resorts up in yeah, Niseko. Yeah, Niseko and Hokkaido. Right. right. But unless you have a specific area that fits yeah, what you're trying right. to do, Tokyo is Tokyo's where you yeah, want okay, to be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How about Osaka? Have you done uh, any, any business in Osaka? Or is it a very different culture for you? Well, the culture is different. And as you know, the language actually oh, yeah, is yeah. different, too. Um, and, and, my, and the thinking is different. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thinking is different. And yeah. I don't know how to characterize it. I, what I would say is I've done a little bit of work with people in Kansai generally. Right. But there's nowhere near as much ICT there. Oh, right. right. If right, you're in pharma, right, right. that's a really pharma yeah, yeah, and biotech yeah, yeah, is very right. important. Rock to be Island, there. Uh, Kobe, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Osaka right. is tough. Well, it just moves so fast. We're we're at the end of our. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it's a. Yeah. We are getting into it. I want to thank Jim for his insights, for a great career, and he's uh, unusual entrepreneurial spirit in Japan, which is really hard even for Japanese to do business, but it's proven that if you have determination, commitment, motivation, and some really savvy tech skills, you can really do make it, uh, kind of making it in Japan. Thank you very much. This is Reisei Chiyama for ThinkTech Asia.